Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Two Juditeras. I'm Babs. I'm Katie. And today we have a special guest, Lauren Richardson. We um, <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> thank you. Um, today we uh, wanted to have Lauren on the show, and thankfully she's agreed to be here with us. Uh, she's a physiotherapist that specializes in women's health. And of course, um, you know, here we are, two women in, in jiu-jitsu and wanting to promote women across across the stage. So, uh, you know, today was kind of a focus on women's health, you know, as Katie and I are always joke about our aging bodies and, you know, we are in the 40 club. So (laughs) we we are in the preservation, you know, wanting to keep our bodies healthy and strong, um, just like we hope all of you out there as well. And uh, obviously we're not the experts, so we bring one on. (laughs) So Lauren, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I've been practicing physio since 2010. And actually, coming into women's health, I took a little bit of a unique journey to get where I am today. So after graduating, I went into neuro rehab, where I practiced for 10 years. Oh, wow. And so, but just like every area of of physiotherapy, you can apply all the same concepts. And after my second kiddo, I was having some pelvic floor dysfunction. I was playing ultimate frisbee. And... It was impacting my ability to play. I was having frequency, so running to the bathroom all the time, some leaking. I'm not afraid to talk about that. (laughs) And I was like, I thought that this would get better after my first. Like, oh, it's common. And it wasn't getting better. So I went out and got some help. And then I realized, like, why isn't everybody getting – why isn't this a standard of care? Why are we okay with normalizing pelvic floor dysfunction, leaking, constipation, pelvic pain, tailbone pain. And uh, so that's what brought me, that's where I, how I got into pelvic floor physio. My physiotherapist was like, hey, I'm opening up a multidisciplinary clinic. Would you be interested in doing this? And I was like, yes. Like I didn't hesitate. That's awesome. Because I saw the importance of it. And so I've been practicing for almost five years now in pelvic floor physiotherapy. That's how I found you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Because it's one of those things, like you said, it's uh, a lot of things get normalized and not to play good or bad sides, but it it is a lot of the women's health stuff gets pushed under the table. It's That's just part of life. It's just what we have to accept. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does affect things like, like you said, you were playing ultimate Frisbee and I'm sure there was, must've been times where you felt like, I don't, can I even do this? Yeah. You know, whereas same for me, it was like, can I do jujitsu? Can I go to the gym? Like having these embarrassing moments, having these, these like this pain. Yeah. So it, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to hear people really being like cheerleaders and, you know, and, and leaders into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it was so interesting because most of my team all, we're in that age of having kids and starting to have kids. And I wasn't the only one. I thought I was the only one. And then I was sitting on the sidelines and mentioned it. Like I'm peeing all the time. Like I'm afraid I'm going to pee my pants. And they're like, Oh, me too. (laughs) And so it is so much more common than you think it is. Like one in three people have some sort of pelvic floor dysfunction, whether that's constipation, yeah, tailbone pain, deep hip pain. It doesn't have to be just leaking urine. Right. Mm, Yeah. And and do you find that, like with the specialty, because obviously like we have that in common about having children, but mm-hmm. how about for women? Who haven't? Yeah. yeah. It's again, super common. Um, there's been lots of studies done on 20 year olds and they have pelvic floor dysfunction, whether that's leaking. So people who are in impact sport tend to have higher uh, rates of leaking. So I think it's one in three high school volleyball players leak. Hmm. Oh, wow. And it's from like gripping and stuff. Just people don't talk about it. It's not like maybe... A lot, but it could be a few drips, okay. right? Um, a lot of women have pelvic pain. Maybe they have endometriosis, heavy periods. All of that can impact the pelvic floor. So when we have any sort of pain within our body, we're going to grip and hold tension. Okay. So can you yeah. explain a little bit about like the gripping, like where kind of where people, women tend to hold that? Yeah. So I don't know, even just in life, women tend to try to fit into boxes, right? Of clenching, squeezing, sucking in. And so when we do that, that's going to lead to more pressure. It's like squeezing a juice box and that can lead to more pressure on the pelvic floor. So our so everybody has a pelvic floor. I don't know if everybody knows what a pelvic floor is, <laughs> but it's a group of muscles that go between the pubic symphysis, so that bone at the front, and forms like a sling towards the back, the tailbone and sacrum. And it works together with our 
our deep core in the front, right. maltepitus in the back, these spinal stabilizers, and our diaphragm at the top. So again, it kind of forms this nice canister. And its role is to help support your internal organs, help with emptying your bowel and bladder, sexual functioning, lymphatic drainage, pressure management. And then it works together with the other muscles around the pelvis to help bring us support. And just like any other muscle in the body, if it's not functioning pro- correctly, it can lead to those symptoms that I had mentioned, but also can lead to low back pain, hip pain, tailbone pain. So things that people might not associate with pelvic floor yeah. issues. Um, and so as women, like even, you know, when you still have your period, you know, people might feel that heaviness or pressure. That's those pelvic floor muscles working harder to help manage all of that. Okay. Yeah. When you say these things, it makes me think of like, <clears throat> there's always like that pressure to do, or not pressure, but People always talk about doing Kegels. Yeah. Like, and then it wasn't that long ago that I heard it's really not good for you to do like a million Kegels. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so just like any other muscle in the body, if you were to over strengthen something that's not tight. So for example, your bicep, right? If I couldn't bend my, like let my elbow fully lengthen. So I have a straight arm. My elbow is always a little bit bent and I'm like, let's do bicep curls. Like you would never do that, Mm. right? We have to be able to fully lengthen a muscle to get a strong contraction. So if somebody's like, oh, I'm leaking, that's just an easy example. I must, my pelvic floor must be really weak. I'll just keep doing it. But in reality, that muscle might be tight and have a hard time absorbing forces. So our pelvic floor doesn't just stay static all the time and just hold load. It moves up and down with movement. Mm -hmm. So if it can't absorb forces, then you might have some of that leaking. So if you're holding a lot of tension in that muscle and you go to cough or squeeze, jump, push, you guys are pulling and pushing and guarding. And if that muscle can't be flexible to absorb all that, that increase in pressure, then you might start to notice some some issues. So that's why you kind of have to figure out, is it a weakness thing or is it a tightness thing? Or is it both weak and tight? And then kind of find out from there. But if people tend to be gripping their jaw, gripping their tummy, gripping their glutes, it's a high probability they're probably holding tension in that pelvic floor. Yeah. It's interesting, even with um, yoga, like, we, we're so conditioned as women to like, like you say, walk around, you have to have that posture, yeah. suck your belly in, all that stuff. We're mm-hmm. not breathing properly. A hundred percent. Like we're doing our bodies a disservice to look a certain way for society to consider us like beautiful and so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> and and if, we're, if we're gripping all the time, like we can't optimize the function of how we're moving, even your shoulders, right? Like if you have shoulder pain and you're just gripping all the time and we're not getting that rib expansion, well, our shoulder attaches to the rib cage. Like everything is connected, even our feet. So if somebody's really flat footed, that can actually, or doesn't have certain range of motion in the feet, that can impact the pelvic floor, yeah. which can impact the hip, which can impact the back, and then all the way up to your jaw. It's pretty crazy. It's wild. I mean, I know for me it was, yeah. you know, I came to see you with burning pain in my hip, and that was the biggest thing. That was like the first, like, you know, aside from the other the other stuff of the pelvic floor, but then it was my gripping. I realized yeah. that I'm gripping. I'm trying to overwork muscles. I'm wearing purses. Like a lot of women wear purses slung mm-hmm. on one side or the other or over the shoulder. Well, I use a backpack now because even just that slight mm-hmm. switch of like holding load on one side or the other really switches everything, right? So yeah. it's unbelievable how like one little thing just carries through the whole body and just wreaks havoc. Yeah. Right? Because I can only imagine what my duty belt and my (laughs) weight vest are doing to my body. Oh, yeah. So I treat even males, and they come in with low back and hip pain. And even then when I ask them about, they have pelvic floors too. And they a lot of those guys who work with heavy belts, whether they're Mm -hmm. police, um, firefighters, and you, they grip too, even more when you have a belt around your waist. Yeah, and you can't get up and down as easy. Yeah. And they all, yeah, they You're, struggle with constipation. I've noticed a big difference, like just in how I walk, like my gait has changed yeah. over the years. So, because I think it's probably close to 30 pounds a gear that I put on my 120 pound frame. Wow. Yeah. Five days a week. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, uh, it's probably tearing me apart. <laughs> Not to be dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like the more people know about their bodies and even finding those muscles can help with everything. Mm. And even just, you know, when you go through different stages of life and stress 
can impact how our pelvic floor or our whole body is functioning. And so sometimes just knowing a few things, whether how breathing can impact the whole system and how important that is, you can feel so much better, Mm -hmm. right? So in yoga, they teach a lot of belly breathing. So that's just pushing things out. Um, A lot of people tend to shallow breathe. And so if we're just breathing through our accessory muscles right here, we're up in our neck and not letting our rib cage expand. Well, that pelvic, you know, we're not letting all that tension go in our bellies. Our pelvic floor is still going to grip because it's not getting that memo to lengthen and relax. And so when we let our diaphragm expand and take these big breaths, we're actually activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for rest and digestion. If I'm breathing through up here, because I'm gripping all day and I'm trying to think, and maybe you're in a competition and you're really anxious about it, and you start to breathe up through here, well, you're going to get more neck tension, pain, but that's going to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for fight or flight. So if you want to like get into the zone before a competition and do your, I don't know, imagery, if that's what you guys do, working on just letting your body take this beautiful 360 breath will help get you more relaxed and ready. So then when you go in there, you're going to be flexible and adaptable. And I'm sure that you guys need to be more fluid instead of being like, oh gosh, they're coming for me. (laughs) I'm usually like stiff. That's why I notice other people that are very, that have been doing it for years. I'm like, man, trying to get like like a leg lock or something, you know, just like a tri- a leg triangle. Like I'm, my, my hips just don't, like I just cannot maneuver, but the tightness, like that's a huge thing. Yeah. Yeah. So in our diaphragm, if you take that big deep breath and it lengthens as it's, as it's coming down, as you inhale, that actually helps to release that psoas muscle, that hip, deep hip flexor. So if people are always complaining of hip tightness, well, sometimes even just looking in on your breathing. That can make a difference. I know I need to work on that. I'm (laughs) I'm a shallow breather. I'm like up here all the time. But that's just decades of being self-conscious about, like you said, our space Mm -hmm. and just gripping and being like making myself small. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And it's hard when people start to be like, okay, how do I get that diaphragm to expand? How do I let my ribs expand? And when people try to do that for the first time, they're like, why is it so hard? Why is breathing so hard? (laughs) Well, you're talking about it. I'm like... Oh, take a deep breath. As you can see, I'm already yeah. like trying to yeah. spank my rib cage. So it'd be interesting for everybody like listening right now. Like, <laughs> can you just sit there and let take a big 360 breath? I bet some people are going to have a hard time without not letting their shoulders rise and everything come up. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Really mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. So what are um, some other commonalities that you see kind of coming in from maybe if it, if it's athletic women or not a, non-athletic athletic women? I think a lot of it is that gripping and holding tension in their bodies. Um, and then, so that's one thing I see a lot, um, having trouble connecting to their deep core. So like I mentioned in that core canister, finding the deep lower abdominal muscles, a lot of women tend to grip the top of their their core. So they're really, they might have those stronger upper abdominals, but having a hard time finding the lower abdominals. And that's going to help play a role in continence by being able to do a nice contraction there with that pelvic floor. Um, so a lot of women are upper grab upper grippers. All right. Yeah. And so I know young athletes, even older athletes will tend to use their hip flexors a lot, but like I can do a million crunches. But when you actually try to get that deep core, that's where people can sometimes have a little bit of trouble. Okay. Um, tailbone pain is quite common in females, I find, either from maybe having a fall at some point in their life when they were younger and then they get older and maybe we start to get a little bit more weakness around our hips and pelvis. Right. And then that can kind of bring up some old injuries. Okay. Um, especially maybe injuries too, like people falling on their butts or you know, hips and things like that. I don't know. Not doing the break falls properly. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Roll like an egg. <laughs> Roll like an egg. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's super common, like trouble there. And then that can lead to or contribute to some pelvic floor issues. Um, a lot of people don't know that um, pe- like pelvic pain is something I treat a lot. And whether that is like having pain with intercourse or pain with penetration or pain with tampons, like that is not normal. And so if people are experiencing that, they know, they should know that they can get help and just, you know, 
sometimes doctors will say, oh, you just need to relax, have a glass of wine, and it will be better. And that's not the case. Right. And maybe they're having pelvic pain because they had a fall on their tailbone. Now all those pelvic floor muscles are really tight. Or maybe they've had some other traumas or just a hit long history of constipation when they were younger and scared to poop. And now those muscles are really tight. But it's a nervous system connection. It's not... um, We don't want to just look at the muscles of the pelvic. We can't blame the pelvic floor muscles for everything. There is that mind-body connection, and we have to be able to to teach those muscles that, you know, if it is a penetration thing or putting in tampons, um, that it's okay, like you're not hurting yourself. I'm always joking about different uh, social stigmas and stuff like that, and I'm laughing in my head about the number of men who are maybe listening to this podcast and realizing women do poop. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. It's true. Yeah. It's a good thing to poop. It's wild how, like, there's this, like, taboo, like, you know what I mean? I love that it's finally getting out there that we, like, can talk about periods and um, different, like, things with women. But mm-hmm. the amount of people who I encounter that are like, women don't poop, we don't fart, like, we do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All of the things. We're humans. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and it's good. It's good. And I love... Like that you said, open conversation yes. around, you know, and less about, and and it, and it should be the same way with men. Like if there's if there's these common issues, they shouldn't be told like you just have to suck it up because you're a man. Right. Yeah. Just like you know, we have a very intricate system, and we shouldn't just be told, well, it's just because you're female. That's just what you have yeah. to go through, right? Yeah. Like it should be celebrated, like our bodies and how they work, and and the miracles and things that that it does for us, and but then also. What are the things that we can do to fix when things aren't working? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to keep going back to their doctor and getting dismissed over and over yes. for these symptoms um, because it's not all in your head. As we age, our estrogen levels decrease. So on average, women turn like um, are hit menopause at 50. And so perimenopause starts in the 40s. So you girls, we're all in this perimenopause <laughs> yeah. phase. And our estrogen levels are decreasing. And we might start to notice more irritability, um, joint pain, stiffness. I'm tired. Tired. all the time. Right? (laughs) Brain fog. All of these symptoms. And and it's a normal, it is a normal part of aging. It is those symptoms that we commonly see in perimenopause. And research has shown the more we know and prepare for perimenopause and menopause, and the better we'll be able to handle those symptoms. And so... In an ideal world, all women should be educated this when they go to their family doctor. Like, oh, okay, yeah, so you you know, you're turning 40 this year. Have you thought about looking into perimenopause and reading about it and learning about it? Because our bones and muscles, um, by the age of like 30, we pretty much have our bone mass bone mass density. And we want to keep that and maintain it. And we have to do that through strength training, which is huge. So if you want to get bulky, no, I know, (laughs) right. We have to change their narrative of being thin and only doing aerobic activity. That is not going to help us maintain our bone density. We need to keep our muscles strong. That's going to help with our bone. Ladies, we want to be thick. Yeah. You want to be strong. You want to maintain that. And our bodies are different. As we get older, the more muscle mass we have, that's what's going to help us stay lean, right? That's going to help burn more calories if that's what your goal is, is to lean or stay strong. Okay. By doing aerobic activity, that's going to put us, like raise our cortisol levels, which already are going to get higher as we age. And when our oh. cortisol levels are higher, it is harder to lose weight. lose weight. So what you wanted to do or what worked for you in your 20s and early 30s are, is not going to work for you when you get into your 40s, 50s, 60s. Ideally, we want to be strength training, like lifting weights four days a week. We want to be increasing our protein because that's going to help with insulin resistance, proper rest, cutting back on our sugars, and lots and lots of fiber because that's going to help make us regular, Yes, (laughs) help with our (laughs) digestion, all of those good things. So I think one of the things I do work with women um, too a lot is reframing, especially in that postpartum period. So maybe you are this female athlete, you have children, and you want to get right back to where you were. Um, we kind of have to reframe that because there's sleep involved. Your nutrition needs might have changed, or you're just like, maybe you're not eating enough. Um, you're in a healing phase. That first year, like there's a lot of hormonal changes. Your sleep is not as consistent. It's more interrupted. Um, so 
you know, after six weeks, your doctor's going to say you're healed from <laughs> delivery. But does that not mean that does not wow. mean that is healed not true <laughs> from pregnancy, right? Like, I mean, the postpartum rage that comes like six to eight months yes. after if some of you are lucky to acquire that. Yeah. There's all kinds of stuff that happens well after yeah. the six week mark. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And so we have to be like, okay, well, I can't just go do that HIIT workout. I am tired. I'm exhausted. So just gradually getting back into things again and lowering our expectations and setting more achievable goals and not pushing ourselves as hard because you will you will still get there and maybe you'll end up in better shape and feel better about your body if we just don't rush back to what we were trying to do. That's going to make things harder. We're kind of building back things from scratch again. Right. Um, but even if you've never had kids or never planned on having kids, again, as you get older, you're, we're going to have to kind of tailor things to how your body will optimally work. So that hardcore, intense aerobic activity is not going to make you guys better athletes. Right. You need to strength train. Okay. That's what's going to help you maintain your agility and flexibility and all of that. That's good. I'm slowly trying to incorporate it. Yeah. I'm uh, starting to do Tabata workouts. Yeah. So just like four exercises, like five rounds. And then I'm just going to try to up the weights as I go along and not necessarily the repetitions, but just get that the progressive weights. load. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And I just, and again, it was flir flirting around with different stuff. Like you said, mm -hmm. sleep, you know, people are working. If you have kids or don't have kids, but you have other obligations, you yeah. have animals, you, you know, you care for other people. I mean, stuff can get in the way and it has for me. And it's just like trying to adjust like I'm not going to do an hour long workout it's not feasible to do that five days a week so mm -hmm. but right now I'm working on three days a week and then doing like a 20 minute Tabata timed I'm there I'm present I get it done and I can get back to whatever else yeah. that I have left for at the time I'm super excited to that. hear this because I hate cardio aside from jiu-jitsu <laughs> yeah it's like I don't want to run on a treadmill. Um, mm. <laughs> I do run a little bit with trails and stuff for th with my dog, which is fun. But in the wintertime, I'm pretty much not doing a whole lot for that. But I do love weightlifting. Yeah. So I wish I did. I'm excited. Oh. I think I'm just scared of it. And just I'm not scared about the bulkiness. And, and I, I, like, I said about the bulkiness, that was clearly sarcasm. But, because it's like, <laughs> but so many women I make still my do husband think tell that. me every day I'm big yeah. and strong. <laughs> It's like, look at these muscles. Strong. Yeah, there's totally still that misconception that if you lift heavy, you're going to look like a bodybuilder. That is not going to happen. Yeah. But you will feel amazing, right? Yeah. Like, and it's so important if you look at older individuals who are still lifting weights or still maybe living independently, they have to go to the grocery store and lift up all those groceries and walk them upstairs or put them away or reach. Like, that is function. And we want to, you know, be able to live to our, our 90s independently yeah. and be able to move things, push things, pull things. And if we run it, be running every day is not going to, no. it's not that functional. No. <laughs> I, I mean, it's still great. You can still, <laughs> I love whatever makes you happy. I'm all yes. for moving your body in ways that feel good to you because if you love it, you're going to do it and any sort of a physical activity. So if you were a runner, don't think that you have to change all the things, but maybe add in some strength training, maybe lift Lift heavy a little bit. Yeah. So don't ask for help. You got it. Just lift it. Right. I saw a really cool, um, like an influencer on Instagram and mm -hmm. she, uh, she does like coaching and whatnot. And it showed cause her mother is also very active mm -hmm. and it was really cool. Cause it showed a picture of her, like a video of her, like lifting up a weight in a certain exercise. And then yeah. it clipped to her mother reaching something off the shelf or lifting the groceries, like you said. Yeah. So she had like four or five different switches of like the exercise she did and how her mother, because she works out, how she's able to do all these things in real life scenarios, which I thought was really awesome. Makes me so think really, of the yeah. Christmas um, commercial of the man that was like lifting the ke the kettlebell. Have you oh, seen yes, that? that made me cry. It does. <laughs> it made me cry too. I could cry thinking about it, but he's like lifting the kettlebell up like every day. And yeah. then it's so that he can lift his grandchild up to put the little star on the tree. I'm like, oh. Yeah, I know. Super sweet. But yeah, there, I mean, exercise isn't just to look a certain way. It really is to be able to live your everyday life independently. Yeah. Yeah. So, and yeah. I know, well, the pain that I like having two children, you know, it is hard with society not to be like, get your body back, yeah. get to what you were in your twenties. And that still haunts me in the back of my head. But you know, when I started coming to you and like, I don't want to accept that I'm just in pain. It was also a matter of, okay, I need a longer term goal than just like lose 20 pounds or lose this or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was, I want to be able to keep up with my kids. 
I want to be as around as long as I possibly can for my friends and family. I don't yeah. want there to be anything that I can't do because I'm sore, I'm in pain and whatever. If uh, Assuming I'm fortunate enough to, you know, keep all of my you know, faculties about me and, yeah. and no, no accidents. But, but yeah, having that strength to be able to run with my kids and because, you know, out of the two of my husband and I, like I'm the one that wrestles with my kids, mm-hmm. <laughs> throws them around and whatever. And I, you know, I don't want to be like, oh, I can't because I just push something out or, uh, you know, having those limitations and then yeah. jujitsu, of course, too. Right. Cause mm-hmm. I mean, you can end up off for, you know, six weeks plus. I mean, some people, right. They're not careful, not take care of themselves. I'm sure. Yeah. Like, do you find you see some athletes that come that maybe they're not strength training and then oh, they I'm- end up like, Yes. Out for a while. Yeah. Uh, or people who haven't done anything for a while and then they're like, I'm going to go play hockey or I'm going to go play volleyball. And they come back and they're like, yeah, I really hurt my back or I sprayed an ankle or this happened. <laughs> yeah. Because we can't just jump into things now as, you know, as we start to age, <laughs> we really do need to work on mobility and training for what we want to, what, what we want to do. Yeah. But... You said you started um, in a neuro? I started in neuro and stroke and brain injury. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's really neat. I loved it because you're getting people who couldn't sit independently, talk, walk, to getting them as independent as possible, to walking and talking with your team of other participants, professionals. And then, um, yeah, so I did that for a very long time. And then when I got into women's health, that's when I got into private practice. So I did actually when I kind of took this like midlife crisis <laughs> and I ended up going working uh, kind of in different areas of the hospital. So with spinal cord patients um, and other like GBS patients, other different neurological, not just stroke and brain injury, and then pediatrics. Oh, and wow. so I did part-time peds and part-time private. So I did see orthopedic patients as well as pelvic health patients, but majority were pelvic health. And then um, when I moved here, I've been here almost three years now wow. in St. John. And so my caseload is primarily orthopedic and pelvic health. And then I do get those neuro clients now because yeah. there's no neuro, neuro outpatient here in the city. Oh, oh really? that's really interesting. Okay. So that's kind of growing too. But again, we look at motor control, strength, coordination across all disciplines. So that physio background, the bread and butter of what we do is easily transferable. And I think that's what I love most about women's health is that it's very much kind of like neuro. You can't just focus in on the pelvic floor. You really have to look at the whole person and maybe they've had longstanding neck and shoulder issues. And, and so that's going to impact the whole system. So I don't know, I find it fascinating and interesting and it's not cookie cutter at all. Every single person who comes in um, has a different story, a different history um, when they come to see me for pelvic floor issues. And sometimes I say like, you know, people cry in my office and that is okay. And I'll say, you know, (laughs) if these walls could talk, they'd be waterfalls because that story might be impacting and contributing to some of their symptoms. And so I really like that part of it. And sometimes it can be really heavy and you go home and you're like, whew, that was a hard day emotionally, but you know, you know that you made a difference. You've helped so many people. Yeah. 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 Um, what would you say to try and encourage women to feel comfortable and just be more open about what, what, like, I think there's that stigma and that embarrassment mm-hmm. that's tied mm-hmm. to, um, our health and I don't, yeah, I mean, there is starting to see a little bit of a shift. I think we're starting to mm-hmm. see some change there, but I think if, just be open about what you're dealing with. Like you're not afraid to be like, oh, my back's sore, my shoulder's bothering me to your friends. But if you are struggling with incontinence, I guarantee if you're over 40, if you've had kids, everybody can relate to these things. And sometimes people joke about it. Um, I saw somebody post this thing and there was like five feet and they were laughing that they all leaked or something with jumping. And I wanted to be like, don't laugh about it. Go get help for, for it. <laughs> and if somebody in that group was like, hey, we can get help for this, that would be better. So the more we are open about some of that stuff, leaking pain, pressure, heaviness, tailbone pain, whatever you're experiencing, um, I think pe- more people will go get help or just say, hey, I heard pelvic floor can help with that. And some people get nervous because they're like, so 
Typically with pelvic floor assessment, people come in, we do a lot of talking. So finding out what brings them in. And then we talk about their bowel habits and their bladder habits because that gives us an idea of how those muscles are functioning. We'll do, ask a little bit about um, penetration. So whether they have pain with tampons or intercourse or whatever it might be. And then we'll do an MSK screen. So check people's range of motions, their stomachs, um, their strength around the pelvis. And then if they're open to it, we'll do an internal exam. And these muscles reside in the body. So it's the best way for us to figure out what's going on. Can you contract those muscles? Can you relax those muscles? Can you hold a contraction, right? Which is important. Mm -hmm. If you want to make it to the bathroom, you got to be whole up to hold (laughs) a contraction. And can you quickly coordinate? So every time you step or run, if you're running, every heel strike you make, your pelvic floor contracts. When your leg is swinging through the air, it lengthens. And so that's how it functions. We want to know, can those muscles quickly work? We don't have to do an internal exam at all. We can get so much information from your history and from what we're seeing on the, when we assess the outside of the pelvis. So some people get nervous, like, oh, I'm really scared to go because I don't want, I'm not a fan. I don't want to do that. And you don't have to have an internal exam. And most women are like, yes, please. I want to know how to find these muscles. I want to know what's going on. And so I just encourage people, if they're listening to this, can you contract your pelvic floor? Do you even know how to do? Can you relax it? Can you hold a contraction? How would you yeah. suggest somebody do that? Okay. So a pelvic floor contraction. Also We're all going to do that. Yeah. You guys are <laughs> We're sitting here. Me. Just know what's happening. <laughs> so, um, so like I mentioned, that core canister. So when we inhale, the diaphragm expands, your transverse abdominis, your belly expands, your pelvic floor should expand. When we exhale, that diaphragm moves back up, your pelvic floor moves back up, your TA comes in. So when we inhale... Everything lengthens, so you're going to think about opening your bum hole, opening your vagina on an inhale. And as you exhale, you're going to blow out and tighten your bum hole and vagina. It should feel like a lift. So cues that I'll use to people is like, think about picking up a blueberry. So as you inhale, you're going to open to grab that blueberry. And as you exhale, you're going to tighten or think about lifting up the blueberry. Or you could think about an arcade claw as you inhale. Your diaphragm is expanding, your pelvic floor is lengthening, and then as you exhale, you're grabbing that toy, the diaphragm is lifting, and your pelvic floor is lifting. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And so being able to find that muscle is just key. And then you can go from there and, yeah. and figure out, okay, well, I can't feel a contraction or I can't feel a relaxation. And you probably know you got to work on working on opening those pelvic floor muscles. And then we call that a reverse Kegel. So as you inhale, you're thinking about opening your bum hole, opening the vagina. As you inhale and breathe into it, so opening like a flower or a jellyfish. And on the exhale, just letting it go. We're not contracting. We're just trying to lengthen more uh, or release. Because it's true. A lot of people, I'm sure, get so discouraged that they're like, I, I don't know. right? Yeah. And then whatever social media and whatever you know they've been told in the past, yeah, those standards, it's like... I don't even know how to do one properly. (laughs) Yeah, and a lot of people want to suck everything up. So they want to go, like, it's just squeezing everything as they're inhaling to lift. Yeah. So some people have been doing Kegels wrong forever, and then they come in to see me, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I've been doing it wrong my (laughs) entire life. And then trying to re-coordinate that is kind of hard. But just with some little bit of training and some cueing and some practicing I like to call it the Oprah moment where they finally get it. They're like, ah, I did it. (laughs) And then they'll be able to kind of do it in in different positions. So some people find they can find their pelvic floor better when they're lying down. Some people find it better when they're in a deep squat on their hands and knees. So there's different positions that you can kind of practice in to see where you can feel it the most. And then I say kind of work in that and then different positions. But say an athlete came in and they're having some pelvic pain and they can't find their pelvic floor. Well, they're not leaking. They're not having that much discomfort or, or symptoms. So their pelvic floors are, are working. It's just hard for them to attend to them. So then I'm going to let's do some squats and lunges and all of these things. And maybe that can help them find their, their those muscles or help improve whatever they're there for. So it's not just about Kegels. We need to put it into function. So yeah, if you guys say I leak every time I, I don't know grab somebody, well, maybe you need to kind of practice doing that Kegel or managing your pressure better, or maybe it's not Kegeling, just relaxing all the things <laughs> as you're grabbing somebody okay. or flipping somebody. 
So what yeah. kind of detriment are we doing if we're working a job where it's a real hassle to go to the bathroom? Like, oh, to go good pee? question. Good it's question. Like, <laughs> it's like, I'll notice like, wow, like I maybe went pee like, during an eight hour shift. Like, yeah. And then I get home and I'm like dying to get everything off and get ready and like go pee. And then I'm just like, that can't be good for my health. <laughs> so that could lead. So in an ideal world, people should be peeing every two to four hours. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if we're holding our bladder for longer than that four hours, maybe we're not drinking enough water, which could lead to constipation and things like that. Um, if we're peeing more than that, we probably have a frequency issue. So we got to work on that, right? You want to be able to to go drive an hour and not have to go to the bathroom. For those people who hold their bladders all day, it's it's not great. And then if you get home and the first thing you do is go back to the bathroom, eventually your bladder is going to be like, we're home. And you're going to get that really strong urge when you get to that front door. And you've probably seen people put their key in the door and they're like, oh my gosh, I have to go pee so bad. <laughs> and then they might end up leaking. So that's called urge incontinence. Okay. And so um, that's where we got to calm that nervous system down and retrain the bladder not to pee maybe every, the first thing you do to get into the house. Okay. Because then some people end up leaking before they get into the house because right. okay. they can't hold it. But for you, I just encourage you to drink a little bit more. Okay. And just go to the bathroom. Yeah. Yes. And it's also the opposite where you shouldn't, like every, like um, I find like before I go to bed, like I'll go pee mm-hmm. and then something will happen and I'll be like, oh, I should go pee again before I like go to sleep so that I don't have to pee through the night. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't have like a full bladder. I don't have the urge yeah. to pee, but I'm like, maybe I should force it so that mm-hmm. I'm not like getting up through the night to have to go pee. Yeah. That's called just in case pees. And those are some, some things that we want to avoid. Okay. So you just like we train our children, like go pee before you leave the house. Like how many, everybody pees before they leave the house because we've been trained to do it. Yeah. Our bladders are very, very <laughs> habitual. So if we always do just in case pees, we're eventually going to teach our bladder to think it's full when it's not. Okay. And so that can lead to just peeing more often, a lot of frequency. Um, so, yeah, we want to avoid just in case peace. That's funny because I'm sure you probably heard this COVID bladder. Yeah. That yeah. was, that was, what is COVID bladder? So I had COVID bladder because school shut down, mm-hmm. COVID hit. I started doing university from home. You're not like running out the same way you were. And it mm-hmm. was just this like, Oh, before class, just the just in case. The just in case pee. And then all of a sudden it was like I couldn't get through a lecture. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go to the bathroom because my body was just on this cycle of like going to the washroom like three, four times an hour. Yeah. Yeah, It was people would walk by their bathroom and be like, Oh, I should just go. That's and that's what it was. That's how I did it. Dishes and they hear the running water and they go, Oh, maybe I should just go. Yeah. And then then your bladder's like, Oh yeah, it's been an hour. You should probably go. And that was me. And the urgency. It was like, I have to go. It wasn't a should I? It was I trained my body to literally be like, I have to go pee now. This wow. is intense. And yeah. that was the whoever I was speaking yeah. to the, when that happened was like COVID bladder. And then I had to train myself to not do the just in case pees and like literally leave yeah. the house thinking like I have to go pee and hold it. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> and still and do the opposite of what you're doing. Like, I, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, like where you're like, hold it all I day. <laughs> but it, yeah. And, and then I had to train myself where now I feel like I'm at a normal place where yeah. I can sleep through the night and I don't feel those urgencies three, four times an hour. <laughs> yeah. So if you're peeing all the time, you can, you can get help for that. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Neat. So urinary frequency, it's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, cool. and you feel so discouraged and like, what mm-hmm. is going on? And then you, you start playing around with your water. Like, oh, I'm drinking too much water. I better slow down. And then you could mm-hmm. be dehydrating yourself because you're yeah. like, I don't want to touch that liquid because I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. And right? we see a lot of that with actually a lot of people. They'll think, oh, if I just drink less water, that's, I won't have to pee. That is a that's myth. That's what I do. That's a <laughs> myth. Because then that concentrated urine that's in your bladder is going to irritate it. And that's going to lead to more urgency. So it's a bladder irritant. So things like coffee, bubbly water, um, pop because it's carbonated, has caffeine, which is also bladder irritant, <laughs> right? All There's a whole bunch of things that can irritate the bladder, giving us that urge. So bubbly water, is yeah. that like hydrating our bodies at all or is that like not really? It is, water? but for some people, that carbonation can cause that bladder urge. Okay. Let's see. So um I mean, I'm, I'm happy people are drinking. If they have to drink that versus nothing, I'd rather right. them get that water into them. Yeah. 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 
but uh, some people overhydrate too. That's a thing. It's it's yeah. having to know too. Like they, a lot of people say it's the standard. You need to have two liters of water a day. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Ideally, like in an ideal world, yeah, if we can, if everybody can drink two liters, that's great. But if you are an athlete and you are going out running and stuff, you probably need more than that. Okay. So you kind of have to look at your body height and weight. You can Google that to see how much water would be best <laughs> for you. But ideally, if people drink two liters and they come in and they tell me and then they're kind of going pee every two to four hours and they don't feel dehydrated, that's probably okay. But for some athletes, yeah, they definitely need to drink more. What about if they're feeling on the opposite end where they're struggling to do the two liters and when they do, it's like then all of a sudden the frequency starts to yeah. pick up. So you have to kind of, again, retrain that bladder. So if somebody comes in and they're like, yeah, I drink two glasses of water a day and I have two cups of coffee a day and maybe a tea at night, then I say, okay, well, let's try and get maybe drink some water before you have that coffee. And that's going to help um, dilute that coffee that's in the bladder so they don't pee as often. Right. But also just get that more of the water coming into their body. So we'll play around. So if somebody's only drinking two glasses of water, I'm not going to say go home and drink eight glasses. Like right. that's impossible and unrealistic. <laughs> and then they're going to pee more because their bladders would be filling up faster, yeah. which is going to give them that urge and make them go pee. So I typically just say, let's start with, four glasses of water, make it more realistic and then get more and more. And most of the time when I say, let's start with four, they come back and they're like, I'm doing great. I'm drinking my two liters of water. Look at my new water bottle. <laughs> and they're so excited and they're like, and I'm peeing less and I feel better. I'm like, that's awesome. I'm like, so, a, yeah. One, Sorry, I'm ahead. like a one to one and a half liters a day. Generally, I have my liter bottle I take with me and I have a little cup mm -hmm. and I kind of keep pouring it and drinking out of that. And then I drink whatever's left over when I'm home. And then I usually go above and beyond that, but I can't seem to get myself to that two liters. I'm it like, it can be hard. It is. Yeah. I've got some bad habits because I go pretty much all day without drinking water because I don't feel like peeing because it's such a hassle to take everything yeah. off when I'm at work. Yeah. And then I get home, I have my quick urgent pee. Yeah. And then I go <laughs> to jujitsu and I yeah. chug water the whole time I'm at jujitsu because I'm like, all right, now I'm active. I need to be doing the things. And then I get home and I'll pee and I'll pee and I do the pee before bed like 15 times to make sure that I'm not going to wake up through the night. To pee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of information. So, to all our viewers. so we just got to hydrate you more. So if somebody's waking up a lot through the night, I typically recommend to stop drinking water two hours before bed. Okay. So in an ideal world, you should be able to sleep throughout the night without getting up unless you are pregnant or postmenopausal and it's normal to get up one time at night. Okay. okay. Yeah. But I have a lot of you know, people who go get up two to three times at night. And then when I tell them that that's not normal, they're shocked. Yeah. I yeah. used to be like that. COVID bladder was the same thing. It was this constant and I had trained myself and now I'm every once in a while I'll get up in the middle of the night, just whatever. I mean, our body, it will happen, but that's yeah. not the norm. It's usually through the, I'm sleeping and yeah. then in the morning. <laughs> Yeah. That's yeah. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of things that, so even if you don't have any pelvic floor concerns, even just booking in with a pelvic floor physio, you're going to learn a ton of stuff that's going to help just like just some of these little tips and tricks to keep you from having any pelvic floor dysfunction or things like that. So um, I have been asked who benefits from pelvic floor physio? Everybody. Anybody with a pelvis. <laughs> nice. Yeah. With everyone. No, yeah. that's awesome. And it's true because you've provided, and I can say firsthand, um, you know, exercises, like what can I do specifically? Mm -hmm. What movements are going to help? Because mine was hips. Some people have really stiff hips. I carry a lot yeah. of stress in my hips. That's where it is. I've had years of gripping mm -hmm. and I, this will be something that I have to work on all of the time. I, yeah. at work, people laugh at me now because I'll be doing weird squats and weird stretches <laughs> like at the printer, like yeah. doing lunges down the hallway when there's, when I think no one's looking because I'm just always trying to like, where can I fit stretching in? Where can I do these movements so that I can <laughs> loosen yeah. those hips? Yeah. But it was, it's nice to have something tangible that it's like, it's on me now. I have this information. If I do this, and even if I mm -hmm. forget a little bit, I'm like, oh, I'm a little stiff. Then I can go right back into, you know, what you've shown me. Don't mm -hmm. forget these exercises. Don't forget these stretches. And generally in between our appointments, it'll, you know, yeah. get rid of that burning pain. So whatever you have there that's going on in your body, there is something that can be done. Totally. <laughs> it's not always fun, but there's something that can be done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah. So just in women in general, I think the more we know, that knowledge is power, and that's going to help set us up for success as our body changes. Um, yeah, hormonally, physically. Yeah. 
Yeah. Where this is such a common um, trait, especially with women who have had children, Mm -hmm. why isn't it just some part of our health care to immediately refer to? It's getting better. Okay. It is. Um, I think a lot more OBs are referring right after. So at that six-week checkup, I hope one day every single one will say go to pelvic floor physio. And I hope one day that it will be available to everybody because right now in New Brunswick, it's only available if you pay privately. Oh, okay. Um, In Nova Scotia, in Alberta, they have women's health clinics that are covered under your just regular Medicare. The waits can be really long for those. Um, But one day, hopefully New Brunswick will come here and we'll just have more access to pelvic floor physio. Yeah. 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 That's good to know. Or just like postpartum, you have a pelvic floor physio come in, give you some hot tips and tricks yeah. <laughs> to help you with that first six weeks or things like that. And I do a birth prep class, so teaching people how to prepare their pelvic floor, positions to labor in, positions to birth in, how to push, um, what to do in those first six weeks to help promote your healing, to help make that recovery easier. Because a lot of the times, you know, you have a million appointments leading up to delivery and then they're like here's your baby good luck and you're like and now nothing. what there's no aftercare yeah and, and so I think that's why we've normalized all of these issues that can pop up because a lot of people have them because they've just never had the care yeah. hmm. no it's true it's fair because it's all about the baby and rightfully so yeah you have all these appointments for the baby but Not you're rightfully so well, well, <laughs> matter too yeah. no I know but I mean <laughs> well, it's good you know you want your baby to coming from a non-mama <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. But it is. I see. It's the constant <laughs> fitting in, right? Because like even my doctor, she's a wonderful doctor. And it's always like going in for my kids. And then I'm like slipping something quick in for myself. It's the afterthought. Yeah. Right? Versus having that time, to, you know, to get a really good answer or yeah. the good test or whatever. Or it's just like, oh, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's again, it's that afterthought. Yeah. Where you well, get- if somebody gets a total knee replacement... That's a big surgery. And then they go, you need to go to physio. You need to do these exercises. Here's right. some free rehab in the hospital. You have a C-section. They're like, here's your baby. Don't lift for six weeks. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck with that. And it's a huge <laughs> abdominal surgery. And there's no post-op care. You That's go at wild. your six-week checkup again. They go, you're all nice and healed. Good luck. Now you can start to do a little bit more, but there's no parameters. And I think that's where people just try to jump back in like, oh, I got the clearance. And then like, really, you need to to gradually get back to where you were. Like vaginal delivery, there's a wound the size of a dinner plate left (laughs) inside your body Mm. and you're bleeding for like a long time. (laughs) And then the C-section, they cut through seven layers and and people can have pain and discomfort and we have to build up that core and your pelvic floor is, is not saved because you've had a C-section. So you might even be dealing with that as well. Or yeah. maybe you tried to push and that didn't work. So it's hard. So when yeah. they're saying like, yeah, you're all healed, like they're essentially just looking at the this like the, the surface. stitches. Yeah, yeah, they're just looking at you from, yeah, like, the like wound. A, heal, a wound perspective. Like okay. your pelvic floor is healed from they delivery. They don't your care that the muscles healed. and all of the internal exactly but we're not looking at, at that how they're functioning now and that's where that us as pelvic floor physios can come in and check how everything's functioning and giving you that guidance so that down the road you don't have chronic back pain because nobody's ever addressed that c-section scar yeah and like lower well, i know and for me back. it was yeah. low back pain anytime i have to you know i'm changing my child i'm picking them up or if i have to stand in a bent over position mm-hmm. my back felt like it was tearing apart and I was like, oh, that's just part of the fact that I had to shuffle and shift my whole body for nine months times two. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't come to see you till, I mean, second one was almost a year old. Yeah. Right. Because, oh. again, some of these things don't come up until, you know, I start jujitsu and all of a sudden mm-hmm. I'm noticing a lot more different areas that are painful or things that are going on. It's just the time, right? You're so busy. You're sleep deprived. There's other things. And it's just not just about mothers, um, mm-hmm. but it could be injuries or things or yeah. stressors or stuff. And then you take in those minutes to go, oh my gosh, why is this hurting? Or you start a new sport and you go, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, this wasn't hurting before. It must be the sport. It's yeah. not. It could be something else that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I do see tons of women who've never had kids who come in and they're like, I shouldn't have these issues. Why am I leaking? I've never had children. So again, the more we talk about that and and normalizing, or not normalizing, making people aware that you don't, just because you haven't had children doesn't mean you're not going to have any pelvic floor issues. Again, as we get older and our estrogen decreases, um, that can lead to 
leaking or could be a factor in leaking. So being postmenopausal, there's a lot of things that come up with that <laughs> and is a risk factor for yeah, heart disease, pelvic organ prolapse, incontinence, all kinds of things. It's one of the number one reasons why um, older individuals, incontinence is the number one reason why older individuals have to go to long-term care. So if their spouse can't help with the incontinence, like it's too much, they often put their them into long-term care. So you see, same with men. Um, but if we kind of deal with these things when they're occurring when they're younger, hopefully that won't be an issue. Right. My grandmother's 90, she's turning 95 next month. She has no pelvic floor dysfunction. She doesn't leak. She doesn't wear liners. She doesn't wear diapers, nothing. And wow. that is amazing because yeah. I honestly think if she wasn't continent, she would not be living at home independently. Wow. Not she probably shouldn't be living at home independently <laughs> right now. But I, that's a huge thing. So, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's Very good. Neat. So get that weight training. Yes. Lift weights, good nutrition. Go fiber. see a physiotherapist. <laughs> Check out your pelvic floor. Get the good eating habits. Get your sleep. Get your water. Yeah. <laughs> and just be okay with not doing the same things you did in your 20s. Yeah. And yeah. adjusting. Adjusting. Yeah. And you're just going to feel so much better when you flip your mind. That's awesome. Yeah. That's wonderful. This is great. Yeah. I learned a lot today. Oh, right. Good. Yes. It's awesome, and and uh, really, really appreciate your time to come on fun. the show and and talk about women's health because uh, you know, as women advocating mm-hmm. for women, it's very important to get the get the message out. So, really appreciate right. it. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me, you guys. Yay. This is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, catch you on the next roll. <laughs>